All right. So let's go on and talk a little bit about the arm. Um, so one thing to notice about the arm. Now, this, the, the position that the skeleton is in here is a really unnatural un, and uncomfortable position for us all to be in. It's called the anatomical reference position. And I have the skeleton in this position just because this is the way that all anatomy books talk about the body. It's, um, it's, 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 un, it's uncomfortable to be in this position, uh, particularly with your arm. Uh, it's, but it's the way in which everything is the most visible because uh, in this position, these two lower arm bones are, per, are parallel to each other, they're not crossed, um, and the hand is facing straight out. And so the doctors really like this because it's a great way to kind of see everything most clearly. But our most comfortable way to be is actually with our thumbs brought forward a little bit. And uh, it's not just what's happening in the lower arm, but also even at our, our, um, our humerus, our upper arm bone, also likes to be rotated in a little bit. And the reason for that is if you look at the same thing we were talking about with the leg a minute ago. If you look at the head of the humerus here and you look at how it's in, inserting into our shoulder blade or clavicle, there's this little area there, a little bowl. Um, and we can kind of move this out of the way and see that little, that little bowl there that the arm is sitting inside. Um, and that uh, little bowl is called the glenoid cavity. And the, um, uh, the arm is most ha happy when it's rotated just a little bit forward um, and instead of kind of forcibly fa for facing straight forward. Um, so that little bit of rotation is called medial rotation. Um, and what's happening in the arm, uh, the lower arm is something else. It's called um, uh, pronation. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later. Um, but this is the most kind of comfortable way for our arm to be. Um, if you get into morphology or studying the muscles, it also is the way in which the muscles of the, of the lower arm are also most efficiently connected from their, uh, their connecting points of origin, their connecting points of insertion. Uh, when your arm is like this. So it's, it's the most comfortable way to be. But what this also means is that when we're uh, walking or when we're just swinging our arms, uh, just comfortably relaxing them, what happens is that our hands come forward uh, like they're going to clap. And then when they go back, they get further away from each other. Um, and so this, this is the default uh, flexion and extension of our arms. Okay. Um, and well, let me just take two seconds. These a couple words I've been throwing out, and I've been kind of, I think I've been describing them as I use them. But there, if you get into this stuff, I would really encourage you to spend some time. Wouldn't take long just to study the main six motions of the of the body. Um, and those main six motions are uh, they're in three pairs. Uh, one pair is flexion and extension, uh, and flexion is. Um, is basically when a bone, a joint that can be straight is, is bent so that it is, I grabbed the wrong thing there. Um, when a bone that can be bent uh, is bent, is flexion. And when it goes back to being straight, that's called extension. Um, and so anytime uh, you can, uh, here, if we were to bend this here forward, now we're flexing at that joint, but if we go back there, it's extension. Um, so flexion and extension are one pair. Um, Another pair is abduction and adduction, and that tends to happen in this plane of movement. So if you bring your foot um, out to the side, you are, you are abducting your foot. If you bring it back in toward the middle, you're adducting it. Same thing up through here. If you bring your arm out, you're abducting it back in. It's adducting. And it sounds like I'm saying the same word. That's a, some, whoever invented that terminology, um, I think was someone who didn't like doctors very much. Um, and just wanted medical students to suffer. And so the, the terms are abduction, abduction, to be abducted or taken away is when your arm moves out. And then ad, add, like to add something back to. So adding to the body is adduction, taking away or abducting from the body is abduction. Um, so that's another pair um, that would be helpful for you to understand. Just to, having the terminology will just help you kind of articulate what's happening with the body the best. And one way, uh, a really nice mnemonic to remember that is when you go into the fetal position, um, just wrap yourself up into a ball, then all the joints in the body um, that can be are flexed. So, think, so if you're ever trying to figure out if something is flexed or not, think, would it be in this position, in the fetal position? And if so, yes, it's flexed. And then if you imagine yourself kind of exploding out into a star, uh, kind of like a jumping jack, a really intense jumping jack position, then everything is extended that can be extended. And it's also um, um, everything that can be abducted is abducted. So in a fetal position, everything's flexed and adducted, and in a star, everything is, um, is extend, 
is extended and AEB ducted, uh, with one exception, which is the shoulder blade, and we'll talk about that later. Okay. Um, and the last pair um, we're going to get to in, um, oh, actually, one we've already talked about, another pair, which is rotation. Um, and that, so things can rotate, and things can rotate toward the body, which is called medial rotation, or things can rotate away from the body, which is called lateral rotation. Okay, so let's look at that in the leg. So we can have medial rotation or lateral rotation. Okay, so, so those are the three main pairs, flexion, extension, abduction, abduction, and adduction, adduction, and medial rotation and lateral rotation. And there's some other special cases, uh, one, only one of which we'll get into tonight, uh, but those are the main ones uh, that will just help you kind of orient yourself to how the body's moving and, and think about how it's moving in planes of movement, and, and it can be really helpful. Um, um, I, for a long time, I was um, not a fan of teaching a lot of vocabulary when I taught anatomy, and I'm a complete convert to that. Now, I, I do teach a lot of vocabulary when I teach anatomy now, because it's, it, I find that once people learn the names, they just learn the concepts a lot easier. Um, so, uh, as we're going back to that now, we have the language to describe what's happening when your arms are flexing, you can see the hands are coming forward, and then when your arms are extending, the hands are going away from each other. Okay, let's play the animation a couple times. So you can see the hands are going forward and back, and forward and back. Okay. Um, and that's the kind of default way that our arms like to swing when we're kind of walking or just naturally, naturally working. Okay. Um, great. And now we're going to get into one of the special cases, um, and that is supination and pronation. It's just another kind of term that when you rotate in your forearm, it has a special name, and that's called supination and pronation. Okay, um, and um, I'm looking at, we're seeing this on a, a bent arms because you can see it most easily. Um, when your arms, uh, the two bones of your arm, which are called the ulna and the radius, um, your ulna is the bone that actually makes the, uh, the elbow, the, the kind of chunky, pointy part of our, of our elbow is called the ulna. There's the ulna right there. Oops, the radius also highlighted with that because they're linked to each other. Um, and then here's the radius over here that goes down and connects to your hand. So your ulna is connected to your upper arm most firmly and your radius is connected to your hand most firmly. Um, and uh, when those two bones are parallel to each other, the term for that is supine. And uh, Robert Beverly Hale, teach, he was teaching at the Art Students League for a long time, his mnemonic for that was that you could hold a bowl of soup when it's supine. Um, but now as, you're, as they start to rotate around each other, Okay, so what happens is, in traditional pronation and supination, the ulna stays still. You can see the ulna is not moving, and the radius is just flopping over it, making an X. Okay, so you can see there's, that's what's happening there. What happens is you can see, if you look up at the elbow, the top of the, of the radius looks like a hockey puck, and that hockey puck is sitting on a little ball up there, um, and uh, the little ball is on your upper arm bone, and that hockey puck is able to just kind of spin around that ball. And that rotation is, has a special name, as I mentioned. It's called pronation. So when you're, when you're in a supine position and you're going toward prone, it's called pronation. And when you are in a prone position and you're moving back toward supine, it's called supination. Okay, so here we have a, 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 a prone arm and now we have a supine arm. And when you're halfway between, which is the way our body is, most happy this is the happiest we like to be, right in the middle. Um, and uh, the, the human body is a little bit, a little bit uh, Taoist that way. It kind of likes to be in the middle. Um, the when you're right in the middle there, it's called demi-prone. Okay, that's the happiest that we are. Now, there in, tr in classic kind of traditional pronation and supination, the ulna doesn't move. And I, I kind of had that nailed into me, actually, for many years. The ulna doesn't move. The radius moves around it. But that actually was a lie. Um, the ulna can move. There are actually two ways we can do pronation and supination. Um, and um, one way you can think about that is there are, there's the way of pronation and supination, like you would turn a page of a book, and you can all kind of look at this yourself now. If you look down at your hand, if you're turning a page of a book, that rotation is going along your pinky finger. So as you're turning the pages of a book, your pinky finger is staying in the same place in space and your hand is just kind of rotating around the axis of your pinky finger. Okay, that's kind of traditional pronation and supination. In that case, your ulna, you can see, is not moving. 
However, there's another kind of uh, pronation and supination we do, and we do it every single day, um, and that is turning a key in a lock. And if you turn a key in a lock, and now if you keep your hand out, you can now think of your middle finger as being the axis, and now you can see that what's happening as you go from pronation to supination is you're rotating around, and your middle finger is the axis of that rotation, and as that's happening, your ulna actually is moving now. So you can see now both bones are moving to make an X with each other. So you can pronate and supinate without moving your ulna, or you can pronate and supinate with moving your ulna. Um, and we do that to do uh, different kinds of actions, like uh, turning a key or turning a page in a book or lots of any other kind of analogous action to that. Um, what enables that is this cool little muscle that's, uh, that's right back here uh, called tri um, um, called the, um, oh dear, I just, <laughs> just blanked out the name, but I'll pop in my head in a second. Um, and I'm still in a little bit of a food coma from a huge uh, meal this evening. Um, but there's this wonderful little uh, muscle back there, um, and uh, that's what makes that what makes that possible. Um, so those are the two kinds of pronation and supination. Let me see if there's anything else in this. Um, oh yeah, moving to the wrist. Okay. So when you're moving your wrist, um, your wrist can can deviate. So. Um, did I put flexion in this animation? Yes, I did. Good. So there's flexion in your wrist and extension in your wrist, and you can flex quite a bit. You can extend um, also quite a bit. Okay, so there's flexion and extension, and all has to, the amount of which you can do that depends on how how uh, how, how how limber you are. Um, but when you move your hand side to side, and this is called it's called different things in different anatomy books. Sometimes it's called um, adduction or abduction, but it gets really confusing when you're away from the body. So my favorite way, my favorite terminology for it is to call talk about ulnar, uh, ulnar deviation, which means you're moving toward your ulna, so that's your the pinky side of your hand, or radial deviation means you're moving toward your radius, which is your thumb. For, we'll just talk about it, meaning moving a pinky movement or thumb movement. And you can see that there's a lot of movement, a lot of movement uh, towards your pinky. Your hand can move that way a lot, but when it comes to moving towards your thumb, there's only a little bit that you can do. Can't deviate very much towards your radius, okay, or towards your thumb, and that's because of the way these bones are. You can see that your radius bone, um, there's something called the styloid process there. It's this little hook of bone that sticks up, and that bumps into the hand, the carpal bones of the hand, uh, pretty easily, but you can see there's a big gap here uh, where before the hand gets to the ulna, and that big gap allows for a lot of ulnar deviation or deviation uh, towards your pinky. Okay, a lot of movement this way, and only a little bit uh, towards your thumb. Okay. Great, I think that covers everything um, in that one. Um, and, um, yeah, this actually, this skeleton, um, it'd be cool if you could use it for your rigs, um, but actually, this. Um, one of the next areas that I'm really psyched to go more deeply into, um, I actually I just took the, the Rigging Dojo class this last round. It was absolutely awesome. I can't tell you how much I learned. Um, and it was to get this thing all rigged and set up. And, and the next thing I want to do is actually start rigging uh, more traditional stuff. And that, what I'm psyched to do is figure out all the ways in which I actually can't do what's done in this rig uh, when, I actually when I actually rig something. Uh, because there's a lot of stuff in this that actually, if you try to, to skin a real skeleton to this, or a real mesh to this, the figure, it actually wouldn't, wouldn't work in, in lots of ways. And um, um, after I've taken that part of the course, it'd be fun to, to go over and talk about all those things. So, okay, let, I think this animation is done. Let's see. Um, all right, next is... Now we get into the really fun stuff. Here we go. All right. All right. Okay. Arm abduction. This is like the most complex and the coolest thing around. 
so let me here let's let's lay it out what the most important thing for you to remember okay you the, the old thing of like you, you can you know 80 percent of what you need to know can be explained in a few minutes and then the other 20 percent takes a lot longer so what is 80 percent of what you need to know about arm abduction here's the basic outline when you're bringing your arm up the rotation pivot is at the top of your arm and your shoulder blade and your collarbone, which are called your shoulder girdle, are not engaged. They just stay there until your arm gets to be at 90 degrees. Okay. Once your arm is at 90 degrees, then the pivot point switches. And now the pivot point is at the end of your collarbone, right here. Okay. And now that's the pivot point and your arm continues to move up continues to move up there until you get close to your ear, okay, until your arm is, until you're about um, uh, 60 degrees up or so, and then the rotation actually switches back to your arm in this magical, oh my god, how the hell did that happen way, and then your arm continues to go on up, okay. So that's, and you can see all kinds of crazies is happening, like the shoulder blade's broken, all kinds of stuff is happening now, we're going to go over it, you know, we're going to make this happen so that nothing breaks in a minute, but that is like, like 90, 80% of all you ever need to know, um, or maybe 90%, or maybe 82%. It's a lot. Most of what you'll need to know is up to, up to horizontal, just your arm. Pivot point there, switching to uh, your clavicle, pivot point switches, and you go on up. Um, if I can grab the right thing here. Oh, I'm, I got the wrong. There we go. Go on up. And then once you get up here, switches back, pivot point switches back to your arm, and away you go. So how does all that happen? Well, one thing that now, so that's the easy way. That's the framework, okay? And that's the kind of grammatical structure. And now let's start adding in all the kind of stuff that makes that grammatical structure um, uh, a lot more complex. One thing that's happening is as your arm is coming up, it is simultaneously rotating, okay? Let's look at that in this animation now. Okay, so as your arm, so I'm going to have this, first I have this arm just kind of go into the natural position. Now, as your arm comes up, okay, watch what's happening with the humerus bone, which is your upper arm bone, this bone here. As that arm, get in the best position to do this, as the arm is coming up, it is rotating. And that was not the best position to see it in, but if we come over here to the side view, here we go. Look at now, look at this, this area right in through here on the humerus bone. It's looking up to the sky a little bit, about 45 degrees. But when it is at your arm, when you're in, uh, actually, if you're in the comfortable position, you can see it's really facing inward. If you're in the reference position, it's facing straight forward. But as it's coming up, it is rotating. So that when your arm, and you can just see this yourself as you're sitting at your computer now, just relax. Don't You can forcibly undo this, but just if you bring your arm up, just look out at your hand, and unless you forcibly didn't do it, if your hand is relaxed, you can see that your palm is probably facing about 45 degrees up toward the ceiling. Um, and certainly the, the humerus bone there, if you're kind of relaxed, again, you can forcibly undo it, but in the, new, the neutral position, in the kind of default, um, it is, you get that little bit of rotation there, okay? Um, that's not all that happened there. As you are coming up, look at what's happening with your shoulder girdle. It's also being engaged a little bit, okay? So as you, even before your arm gets to horizontal, there actually is some shoulder girdle movement, but notice this, it's actually mostly in your scapula. It's mostly in your shoulder blade. It's not very much in your clavicle, a little bit in your clavicle, but it's mostly in your shoulder blade, okay? A little bit of clavicle, but it's mostly in your shoulder blade. Why is that happening? Um, well, that's happening because of this cool mechanical situation that's happening here with this part of the bone of your, of your humerus. Um, and so this is the head of your humerus, and you've got this ridge off the head of your humerus is called the greater tubercle. Okay? And that greater tubercle is kind of like uh, a wedge. And that greater tubercle, as soon as it starts to hit this plate of bone, that is at the end of your shoulder blade. Okay, it's called the acromion process, that plate of bone. And as soon as the uh, greater tubercle, which is also called the rotator cuff, as soon as it starts to hit that, kind of wedges in it like, uh, like a wedge going underneath the door, and that makes it start to move. And then once the, it is fully wedged in, okay, when it's fully wedged in, then they're locked in place. Okay? Now they're locked in place, that 
that rotator cuff or greater tubercle is fully wedged in, fully locked in place, and now look, now, now the pivot point has completely moved to the end of the collarbone, okay? And because now this joint is locked in place and it's going to continue going on up, okay? It's going to continue going on up. And then, it, like I said before, it gets to this place almost the top and then the pivot point switches back. Now, how the hell did that happen? What happened was that as it was going up, everything was continuing to rotate, continuing to rotate. Watch this shoulder blade. Watch your scapula rotate, rotate. Look at that, remember that ridge of bone that was blocking our way, or that, that plate of bone called the acromion process? It was blocking our way, it's rotating, and it rotates so much it gets out of the way. And once it gets out of the way, ah, freedom, freedom. Now the arm is not blocked, and now it can keep going on up. And then you can pat yourself on your ear because you're so happy that you made it. Okay, let's so watch that a couple times. As you can see, it goes on up. Okay, let's give it a little. Okay, we'll watch this from a couple points of view so you can see what's happening here. Coming up, everything's rotating, getting out of the way, and then the arm can flop on over. Okay. Okay. So that is um, arm abduction going all the way up. And so, so the things to remember from that are, remember the, the most important thing, arm rotating pivot is here at the top, just the arm, to show, no shoulder girdle to get to 90 degrees. Then clicking over to the collarbone to as you go on up. And then switching back to the humerus to finish it. And the thing to remember that goes along with that is while all that is happening, the arm is simultaneously rotating and the shoulder blade is, is sliding around the rib cage so that a chromium process or plate of bone there can get out of the way of the arm to finish its job. Okay, um, so that's that uh, in, a, in a nutshell. Um, and now we've got just a couple more here. This has got the same thing, same kind of situation happens when you flex your arm, bring your arm up, bring it on up over your head, and you can go on and you can pat yourself on the back. Um, and it's the same kind of stuff that's happening here. Um, you can see as your arm is coming up, more or less, it's kind of the same rule, same rule applies here when your arm is, uh, is rotating up. That rotation is just pretty much at the top of your arm until it gets to be um, up higher, and then the shoulder blade starts to get engaged um, once you get uh, at about the 90 degree level. Starts, your shoulder girdle starts to get engaged, and your arm comes on up and goes on over. And I just zoomed in so we didn't miss that entirely. Okay, there's your arm, shoulder girdle gets engaged. Now the shoulder girdle's moving, now the shoulder girdle stops. Now it's just your arm again, and you can see that the same kind of rotation is happening there. Okay, let's get a little closer, close-up view on this now. One last time, it goes up. See the shoulder girdle's engaged, shoulder girdle is not engaged anymore, and then you're, you come around and pat yourself. Okay, so I think, you know, the big takeaway from this is that idea of the changing pivot points. That your arm, unlike your leg, which only has one pivot point, which is the top of the leg bone. Your arm has two pivot points. One's the top of the femur, or well, one's the top of the humerus, rather, the arm bone, um, and the other is, um, is your collarbone. Okay? And so, and now what we've done, obviously, is we've just gone over a really basic movement, um, and you can have all kinds of craziness that happens there. You know, your, of course, your arm doesn't have to, you know, you don't have to wait till you get here to engage this pivot. You know, obviously when we, sh when we shrug our shoulders, um, we're just pivoting here. I've got an animation in a minute, the last animation, we're gonna look at a lot of independent shoulder movement that we'll look at right now, okay? Um, and um, let me just see over here if there are any. Okay. 
if I've missed any questions over there, um, then we'll just um, make sure I get them, get them at the end. Um, okay, this is the last animation, and I, I want to briefly go over a couple proportion things, and then we'll uh, open up to any questions. Um, so let's just look at some stuff that's happening in the shoulder. Um, the shoulder, there was, um, I was once recently um, talking with some of the people who teach anatomy at Brown University, and uh, it happened that one of them, her, her father was visiting her, visiting her that day, and he also was a professor of anatomy, uh, I think at Cornell, I can't remember where, and he said that uh, the, the shoulder was, uh, from his point of view, uh, real evidence of the, that there is no such thing as intelligent design, just because of the all the craziness that has to happen in the shoulder. Um, um, it could go either way. Uh, uh, it can be lack of evidence of intelligent design or the fact that the shoulder moves the way it does has all this ability for us to do all of this wild stuff. It's allowed us to be the kind of people we are and that could be incredibly intelligent. So I don't know, um, one could uh, make either argument there. Um, so let's, uh, let's just kind of go through this a little slowly and just kind of look at some of the stuff that's happening here um, in this, uh, this shoulder animation. Um, so your shoulder can, and by here we're mostly talking about the scapula here, okay? Your, your scapula or your shoulder blade can slide across your rib cage this way, can slide forward. Now notice when it does that, the hinge joint for that is at the end of your collarbone, okay? See that point's not changing, that's the connection point. The only bone-to-bone -bone connection between your arm and the rest of your body is that little tiny place at the end of your collarbone. There's a lot of other really strong muscle attachments, but that's the only bone-to-bone -bone attachments. That's where all the real pivots take place. It's right there. So your, your shoulder blade can slide forward like that. You can see it can slide quite, quite far forward. Okay, there's a lot of ability to slide forward. It can also slide pretty far back. Okay. Um, going back to my mnemonic device for remembering abduction and adduction, I said there was one exception. When you are curled up in a ball, like a fetal position, all of your joints that can be are adducted, adducted, except your shoulder. When you're in a fetal position, your shoulder's like this, that is actually abducted, abducted, because it's been taken away from the center line of your back. Um, and when you burst out into a star or like a, a jumping jack position, in that case, every, all the joints that can be are um, adducted, ad, I'm sorry, I just, had, I just got that backwards. When you're in a fetal position, everything is adducted, adducted, brought together, except your shoulder blade. When you burst out into a star, everything has been taken away from your body or abducted, abducted, except your shoulder blade, because when you burst out into a star, it moves into the center like this. So your shoulder um, has actually been abducted. That's the one exception for that, that mnemonic uh, device there. So what else can your shoulder blade do? It can also, you can hunch your shoulders. Okay, you can bring it straight up, which is all, basically what's happening there is your shoulder blade is, is rotating. Um, and the pivot, the kind of artificial pivot for that is right around in this place of the shoulder blade. You can see when it's when it's moving, that's kind of where that's kind of close to where it actually seems to be pivoting as a pivot point. You see, I call it an artificial pivot because there isn't any real pivot there. All the pivoting is actually it's a combination of two pivots. It's the pivot here at the end of the collarbone, and also pivoting is happening where the collarbone attaches to your scapula, and those two combined pivots allow for that motion. But if you were just to look at the scapula alone in space, independently of anything else, it would appear to be pivoting around something that's kind of right in through here. Okay. Um, and even when you shrug your shoulder, you can also bring it forward. When you shrug your shoulder, you can also bring it back. So all kinds of movements there um, in, your, in your shoulder. Oh, and then you can also rotate, this the last one on here, you can also rotate it so that it's called the inferior angle. It's this bottom corner of your uh, shoulder blade. It pops out, kind of, and you can see some people actually can pop it out from underneath. It's, it normally sits underneath the muscle called latissimus dorsi, um, but some people have the ability to pop it out from underneath latissimus dorsi, and it really pops out there. Um, we all have the ability to do this rotation, but some people, when they do this rotation, it kind of pops out. It's kind of cool uh, to see that when that happens. Cool or creepy, depending on your point of view. I, I find it cool. Um, and that is the end of our animations. Let me just, there's one other thing I want to to do, and um, then I was open to questions. And this, um, I think this will be is helpful uh, for riggers and animators, it's helpful for everyone. It's, it's certainly definitely helpful for modelers. Um, just a quick, quick rundown of proportions. And the reason I want to do this, proportions are something usually people like here, and it's like 
you know, like yawn, time for bed, you know, it's great. You, I, I'm having problems falling asleep. I'll get my proportion book and it's going to knock me right out. But that's because most people, when they do proportions, like it's a million tiny proportions, you're trying to memorize everything. And that's not necessarily the case. All you need to know to know your proportions is a few things. Everything else tends to click into place. Okay, so what are those few things you need to know? You need to know where the middle of the body is. And where the middle of the body is, is at the top of your leg. Okay, so if you take your leg off and you bring this one over here, let's flip over to ortho view. Um, okay, so if you bring this one over here, and now notice by top of leg, I do not mean the top of the leg bone. Okay, well, by top of leg, I mean right there. Right, there's this bump of bone, which is the hip bone. You hip check somebody um, if you're playing hockey. Um, that little bump of bone there is called your greater trochanter. And I, I call it the top of the leg because when you look at someone's leg, that looks like the top of the leg in a fleshed out human body. That's kind of where the leg seems to be bending. It's where the leg looks like it goes into the body and the pelvis. It's right there. So if you go up to what looks like the top of the leg, when you bend your leg, it's kind of where you, that bend is happening, or you can find a little bump of bone there called the greater trochanter. From there on up to the top, you can see if you go on up to the top of this greater trochanter, it's right on up at the, uh, the top of the head. So the middle of the body basically is the legs uh, on down. Now notice the pelvis it doesn't mean it's the bottom of the torso because the pelvis comes down below that a little bit. So, so the torso and the legs interlock with each other a little bit. The torso goes down below the top of the legs. The top of the leg goes up into the pelvis a little bit. That's important to remember. Um, but the, uh, that's the middle point. So keep the middle in the middle. That's one thing to remember. And if, if you do that, then like, that's like the most important thing, like 80% of the way there. You're, almost all your other proportions will keep in place. I, I can't tell you, in, in, in all my years of teaching, when this is, for, not only is this the most important one, it's, most, it's the one pe most people get wrong. Um, and that's why I stress it so much. And I think the reason most people get this wrong um, is because um, we, you know, we, we, when we're talking to people in life, we're pretty close to each other and we're looking down on each other. And so we have memorized a, a foreshortened sense of the human body. And so we've, we've actually memorized in our brain a sense of legs being actually shorter than they usually are. Um, now, one other thing about proportions. Is this the case of everyone? No. Some people have legs that are shorter than their upper half. Some people have upper halves that are longer uh, or shorter than their lower half. This varies from person to person. But this is, this is a good starting off point. And you'll find if, if, you, if you kind of think this way, then you'll be able to really quickly capture someone's specific character of their body. Um, you, you, so, for example, if you say that person has, has kind of shorter legs or that person has longer legs, well, you need something to understand what shorter means. What does shorter mean? You have to have some kind of base to begin that with. And this is the kind of standard from, from all, all the art anatomy books uh, you have this as kind of the middle, and it's also just, it is the middle. If you, in all the models I've worked with over the years, you know, some people have a little bit longer legs, some people have a little bit shorter legs, but the average of all the models is, is that. Okay, so that's the most important one. What else is important? Then if you take the lower leg, okay, um, the lower leg, where the knee bends, is about half of the leg. Um, and so the, the leg is half of the overall height, and then the knee, where the actual knee bends, which at the bottom of the kneecap, notice that the kneecap belongs to the upper leg bone, um, where the knee bends is about um, half of the overall leg. Now, usually, the lower half is a little bit longer than the upper half, and you can see that's actually happening here. You can see, go from the bottom of this foot, let's go back into perspective here. If you go from the bottom of this foot, okay, bottom of the foot up to the top of this tibia, we've gotten a little bit above the middle, okay? And that's very, very common, that the, the lower leg is a little bit longer than the upper leg. And again, I stress that because 90% of the time, even more, 99% of the time, when people are making sculptures in my classes, they make the lower leg too short. They make the overall leg too short, and they make the lower leg too short. I think it goes back to the same reason. We've just memorized the foreshortened part of the human body. So, so those two proportions are the most important thing. Another thing that's nice, though, when you start thinking about the lower leg, Okay, the foot and the lower leg, they correspond to a lot of other places in the body. They correspond to the, um, the arm and hand. Now, remember going way back, I said that Leonardo da Vinci, when he made this figure, he made it fit into the square, and I said that his arm was short. Here you can really see that. In, it, it, in many people, the arm and hand are about the same as the lower uh, leg and foot, and you can see his is definitely shorter there. Um, and so that happens. Of course, there are people, there are, you know, a lot of people that it happens. And so this is not, is this wrong? No, it's not wrong. It's just um, 
not following these you know, specific kind of proportions. They're the ones I like to memorize. Um, another thing that's helpful with that is the, let's go back to ortho here. We can only see this. Um, the, um, the lower leg and foot are also the same as from the bottom of your chin down to about the belly button. The belly button usually tends to be about the top of the uh, pelvis. And so from the bottom of your chin down to the belly button is often the same as the lower leg and foot. It varies from person to person, but it's just kind of a nice, a nice uh, uh, thing to, uh, to think about to help you memorize that. And then if we go to the back of the body, in the back of the body, from the top of your rib cage, okay, um, or the base of your neck, um, and the anatomical point there is something called uh, C7, the seventh cervical vertebrae. Um, from C7 down to those two little dimples that you often will see on the top of that triangle. The triangle is called the sacrum. And many people have two little dimples on their back there. Those are called the back points of the pelvis. And that's the, the, the anatomical term for that, which is just a translation of back points of the pelvis, is the posterior superior iliac spines. But that lower, lower leg and foot tend to be about that. So from the base of the neck down to those two little dimples there is also your lower leg. Um, and then uh, a couple other things your, your lower leg and foot correspond to are the width across the shoulders. Okay. Once you've got muscles on this figure, and, and this tends to be more true in male figures than in female figures, but that from the, 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 um, the foot and lower leg uh, are about the same as from the wide point of your deltoid to the wide point of your deltoid there across the shoulder. So those are just a few things but they, if you keep those in place, you will really be in great shape. Uh, everything else will tend to click into place. So keep the middle in the middle. And remember all those, some of those correspondences of the, where the lower leg relates to. And everything will be in great, great, great shape. Um, one last thing about proportion is the male and female body. And basically, the main difference in the skeleton between male and female bodies, um, and this is the main difference in terms of form, uh, all of the muscles just kind of wrap around these underlying core structural differences. Um, and that is that in a, in, a, in a male body, the rib cage and pelvis are about the same width. Sometimes the rib cage is a little bit wider than the, than the pelvis. You can see that's the case here in the Leonardo Vitruvian man figure. The rib cage is a little bit wider than the pelvis. Uh, but in uh, uh, feminine bodies, uh, in mo most women's bodies, actually this is true for, oh, in women's bodies, um, the rib cage is narrower than the pelvis. Okay, so you can see here's a male, female, male, female, male, female. Okay, so you can see the rib cage is getting narrower, pelvis is getting wider, and vice versa, going back and forth. And from the side view, you can see a little bit of difference there that, that uh, males tend to have a little bit more depth uh, in the rib cage and pelvis, and females, it's a little bit shallower. Um, but that really varies from person to person. There's a lot of variation there. Um, some some men have shallow or, or don't have you know big barrel chests, and some women uh, do. So there's a lot of uh, some variation there. Uh, but those these are the things that, that are are those strong tendencies. Um, and then just one last couple last little fun things. Your collarbone. Um, uh, Rob Beverly Hale again, that guy who used to teach the Art Students League, loved the the breastbone and collarbone. He used to relate them to a lot of things. Uh, about the same as the width of the head, um, and your hand is about the same height as your face, so it's a little bit higher than your head usually, and your foot is a little bit bigger than your head. Um, looks especially bigger there because I'm in perspective mode. Uh, if we go over here in ortho, you can see it's just a little bit bigger. So your foot's a little bit taller than your head, your hand is smaller, your hand's about the size of your face, um, and your foot is a little bit bigger than your head. And that's all of our proportions. Um, so that is everything, and we're pretty much close to around time. Um, um, yes, that is exactly it. Men, women need to pass a baby through there, and that is why that pelvis is wider, and, uh, and that, that's where that comes from. So if anybody has any questions, now will be uh, Great time to do it. Um, and yeah, first question, which artist in your book? Oh, yeah. Uh, modeling hands, arms, which is the best way to model hands outward? Um, so the anatomy books, um, I have a, a bunch of them. And I, I think uh, if, 
it depends on what your what your desires are. If one the book I usually sign for my uh, classes at uh, RISD um, and uh, the classes I used to teach at the uh, New York Academy uh, was um, a couple of them. Either uh, a book, a French anatomy book, has been translated by Robert Beverly Hale. Robert Beverly Hale is the person I, I referred to before. Um, he used to teach at the Art Students League, um, and um, the the initial author of that is a man named Paul uh, Richer or Richer R I C H E R, and is translated by Robert Beverly Hale. Um, and you know, I, after all these years, I, I can never remember the names of any of the anatomy books because they're all so similar. Uh, it's either, I think it's called Artistic Anatomy, but, or it's called Anatomy for Artists, um, or it's called Artistic Anatomy for Artists. They're all, I, I get them confused. Um, um, but it's the one by, so I remember them by author. Uh, so that's Roche um, or Richer. Um, it's a great one. Um, another really good one is one by Stephen Rogers Peck. And those are both really good because they're also really cheap. Um, and they're also really good because they're great complements for each other. Uh, the Stephen Rogers Peck has these great lecture illustrations he did that really talk about how to kind of put the body together, and but then some of the ways things are laid out in the um, in the in the Roche is really great. Um, Elliot Goldfinger's book, which is only in hard cutbacks, so it's still really expensive, is a great great book. Um, if you want to have a book that you know you're just going to like read through um, and is a way to kind of memorize all the muscles um, and come to understand what each muscle does then I, I, that's the one I strongly re recommend the most, is Elliot Goldfinger's book. Um, and, um, um, oh great, um, and, uh, but Elliot Goldfinger's book is great. Um, and so those are, those are some of the books uh, that I recommend. Um, and um, uh, so the next part of the question, second, uh, modeling hands and arms, which is the best way to model the hands, outward like this character or rotated so that when rigged, animated, the forearm wrist. You know what, that is a great question for your mentor. Um, uh, and then, and I, I'm, I'm not the best one to answer that question. Um, uh, you know, that's, that's something that's been kind of changing now too because a lot of people are starting to model things um, kind of slightly bent so that the, the range of motion doesn't have to go entirely in one way or another. Um, but, but one thing I can definitely tell you is the best way to the, the anatomical reference position is 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 not the best way to model your figures at all. In fact, you know the the standard uh, you know for a long time was to model things in a in a T position, um, uh, and that's you know that's gone out now too for the most part because um, you know when you're in a T position like this, which often was called the Da Vinci pose, uh, uh, but um, uh, then you know mo most most of the time your characters are not going to have their arms up. Most of the time your characters are going to have their arms kind of down, and so you know to, it makes more sense. And what's usually the standard is often more so now. People kind of model their arms out a little bit like this because it's closer to the ranges they'll normally be in. Um, but uh, definitely check with your your mentor about that question. Um, and um, Uh, yeah, Elliot's book is expensive and uh, yeah, it's really expensive, um, but you, know, you might be able to find some used copies out there now. But that's why um, um, you know the others. You can get all the information you need to in the others, and uh, um, and there's a lot of other really great ones out there. Um, you, when you're looking for an artistic anatomy book, you just want to find something that that covers things thoroughly, um, and uh, you know just spend some time looking through it and see if it presents the information clearly, um, and uh, read through it, see if it's you know something that's not going to completely put you to sleep while you read it. Um, so. Um, oh, and just a question. Can I go over uh, the ulna and where the motion happens? Yeah, let's, um, uh, let's just review that real quickly. Um, okay. 
Um, so the question was, can I go over the ulna and where the mo motion happens? Um, and um, so when you are flexing your arm, oh, I'm still in ortho here, okay. Um, when you're flexing your arm, your ulna is moving in something called the trochlea. Um, and um, this, this, this trochlea over here, and I don't have it in a lot of detail in this model, but it kind of looks like a, an hourglass. And the ulna kind of looks like a, when you look at the ulna by itself, it kind of looks like a bird's beak. It's kind of, and that bird's beak is kind of biting on the trochlea. And, um, and it rotates around that trochlea. So it's kind of a bird's beak biting on an hourglass and it rotates it around like that, okay? So that's flexion, and you can see in the back, there's a hole, I can, if I put the graph on, if I put the grid on there, you can see there's a little hole in the back, and the limit of extension in your ulna is the degree to which that top of the bird's beak, it's called the olecranon process, the degree to which that can fit into that hole on the back, and, and some people have deeper holes there than others, and some people have smaller bird's beaks, so um, that combination, some people, when you straight your arm, it's just a straight line from the side, but some people can extend their arm beyond that. A lot of people can extend their arm beyond a straight line. It's called hyperextension. That just means that that relationship between that hole in the back of the humerus and the bird's beak is, uh, is such that it allows that hyperextension to take place. Um, so that's flexion and extension there. And then uh, uh, pronation and... Um, And supination, um, or just those, those cases where um, the radius is wrapping around the ulna, and the ulna will sometimes move in pronation and supination, but other times it uh, it will not. Um, sometimes you can see here, you can see the the arm is is rotating, the, the radius is wrapping around the ulna, but the ulna is not moving. And here you can see they are both uh, moving, and it just depends on what muscles are. Engaged, and here's the time that I should remember that name of that muscle again. The anconius. Anconius. Does somebody write that? Anybody else remember that? No. Anconius is that muscle. It's, uh, let's, um, let's, uh, let's take a quick look at anconius while we're, um, let's take a quick look. Anconius. So, um, this is the, Morphological figure, which isn't animatable yet, but that I use in my anatomy classes. So this is anconius right there, that little triangle right there, tiny little muscle, but that's what allows that rate that ulna to uh, to rotate along with the radius during some forms of pronation and supination. Okay. Um, okay. Um, Looking at the questions again here. Okay, I think. Uh, were there any other questions in here that I've missed? I don't think there were. Um, uh, so this is going to kind of wrap up my section here. I am. Um, I am in the process of starting to do and wanting to do more stuff like this online. And um, 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 hopefully I'll be doing more stuff uh, with Breaking Jojo going forward, but also um, wanting to, to get into doing some more lectures online uh, with um, the, the muscles, the morphology, a lot of the stuff that I've, that I've done at RISD for a long time. Um, and if any of you are interested in that, um, there, there are two websites you can, you can check out. One is uh, called 3danatomymentor.com. It's 3danatomymentor.com. And the, um, the other one is, um, um, just flipping back over so you guys can see me, um, is jeffhesser.com. And uh, both of those websites are, are kind of still very much under construction. Um, but if you check those periodically, then I'll be posting on there whenever I'm going to do anything. Uh, another thing you can do is just uh, uh, send me a, uh, an, a, uh, a just uh, a friend invite on Facebook, and I'll be posting on my Facebook page whenever I'm going to do anything. And um, 
um, or you could send me a, your email address. And my email address is, uh, uh, is I'm going to post it right, right here right now. It's just J. Right. Um, so there's my uh, email address. So just uh, just send me your email address, and I'm gonna go get you on a list. And then whenever I'm gonna do anything online, uh, then I'll, I'll uh, make sure that you're on a, a group that I can send stuff out on. And like I say, I'm gonna st hopefully start uh, in not too distant future, just doing some uh, periodic lectures where I'll start to go over all the the morphology of the body using this uh, figure that you were just looking at there a minute ago and all the muscles on it. And so I am, thank you guys all so much for, for coming by tonight. Um, I see some names on there that are great to be back in touch with. Great to see you guys and everyone else. Um, thank you very much. Wow. Oh. That was great. Thanks a lot, Jeff. Uh, and thanks everyone for swinging by. Uh, the websites uh, are in the chat on the bottom, uh, jeffhesser.com and um, 3 danatomymentorcom and uh, riggingdojo.com is the rigging dojo. Uh, thanks again. All right, guys, I'm going to end the, uh, the vocal session here, and uh, thanks again for coming. Really appreciate it.